Today, we are going back, way back, before Mallard, before Victoria, and even before the famous Rainhall Trials. We're going back all the way to 1771, and we start our story in the town of Trejoran in Cornwall, to the birth of the father of the steam locomotive, Richard Trevevick. Richard Jr. was the second youngest child to Captain Richard Trevevick and his wife Antique, and was the only son of six siblings. Richard's father was a miner and was very well respected among his fellow colleagues. As a youngster, Richard was a bright boy and he would watch the coal fields with curiosity. He would watch as the stationary steam engines would pump water from the tin and copper mines near to his home and would marvel at how they worked. As a youngster, even though he was considered bright and showed athletic promise, particularly in wrestling, and became the best in the county, he did not take well to schooling with his schoolmaster calling him spoilt and disobedient. Unusually for boys at the time, Richard started his working life at the age of 19, very late by the time period standard, and started as a miner in the East Stray Park Mine. He enjoyed the work and worked quickly up to the ranks of consultant. Richard's father passed in the same year Richard married his wife Jane. Jane's father was a blacksmith by trade, but his foundry had moved into producing pump engines, known as beam engines. To get the water out of the mines, beam engines used steam but at very low pressure. The steam was allowed to condense, creating a vacuum which would cause a piston to lower. The piston was connected to a large beam which pivots. As one end of the beam goes down, the other goes up in a seesaw motion. This was then connected to the plump or flywheel, or any form of engine that needed power. Through his wife's family ties, Richard once again became fascinated by these low pressure engines, even as he moved into the Ding Dong Mine on his promotion to engineer. Richard began to experiment and modify existing low pressure engines to see how they coped with high pressure. The more he experimented with the new power, the more he learned how to control it safely. As boiler design became more advanced and better materials was produced that could withstand greater pressure, Richard felt it was time to produce a high pressure steam boiler of his own. He wanted a similar principle to the beam engine, where the steam would power a piston, but unlike the beam engines, this new engine would not need to be as big, as it would not need the cumbersome condenser and the cylinder could be greatly reduced. In fact, he surmised he could get the engine so small might even be possible for it to be self-propelled. After many experiments, both with standing engines and ones attached to road carriages, Richard had enough experience to build the first ever road locomotive. On Christmas Eve 1801, at his workshop near 4th Street on Cambon, Richard unveiled his aptly named Puffing Devil to the world. The engine had a horizontal boiler with vertical pressure operated steam pistons. Richard successfully chug chugged around the town, carrying six of his friends at a steady walking pace. Sadly, the Puffing Devil had a very short life. Three days after its unveiling, the engine broke down as it passed over a gully. The passengers and drivers left the engine under a shelter while they went to the pub. Sadly, the men had no clue of proper safety and left the engine's fire burning while they dined and drank. As the water evaporated, the fire raged out of control and by the time the men realised what was happening, the engine was a spectacular fireball. Despite the Puffing Devil's demise, Richard knew his machines worked and patented the boiler and built a stationary engine at Colebrookdale. But the next few years would prove challenging. Colebrookdale built a new steam locomotive, but an accident involving the engine costing the lives of one of the men forced the company to reconsider moving forward with the new plans, and the engine was quickly shunted into history and the plans shelved. With the Puffing Devil gone, Richard built another road carriage, but the ride was uncomfortable for passengers and uneconomical against the cheaper horsepower. And in 1803, one of Richard's stationary pumping engines exploded, killing four workers. The accident opened the door for Richard's hardest critics, James Watt and Matthew Bolton, who were only too happy to promote their own low-pressured engines. Richard knew he would need some form of safety feature to be incorporated into future designs. He added two safety valves. One was a tried and tested safety valve design many years before and allowed the driver to set the maximum steam pressure. The other was Richard's own design. A simple plug of lead positioned just below the safe minimum water level. If the water dropped and the lead plug was exposed, the plug would melt and release steam into the fire, reducing the boiler pressure and, and sounding an audible alarm for the crew to damp down the fire. 
As well as the new safety features, Richard introduced mandatory testing of boilers to test pressure. In 1802, Richard made a high-pressure steam stationary engine for the Penny Darren Ironworks. The engine was designed at first to drive the hammer at the ironworks, but Richard knew it could do so much more. The proprietor of the ironworks, Samuel Humphrey, allowed for Richard to mount the engine on wheels and turn it into a locomotive. Once the engine was ready, Humphrey made a bet with a local ironworks competitor for 500 guineas that the locomotive could haul 10 tons of iron nearly 10 miles. The wager caused great public interest and in 1804 the engine was put through its paces and made the full distance in just over 4 hours with a full load, an additional 5 wagons and 70 passengers. Once the wager was settled, the engine was remounted back onto its stationary plinth and returned to its regular job once more. Richard wasn't in the game for a simple wager. He wanted to prove to the world that his high-pressure steam was the way of the future. So in 1808, he created the first ever steam circus. The engine ran on a 100 feet circular track surrounded by a high panel fence. The fence meant that the engine was only visible to those who paid. The engine, called Catch Me Who Can, manned an impressive 12, pounds, 12 miles per hour and its creation was the first ever locomotive to haul fare paying passengers. The shilling fare sadly would never cover the Catch Me Who Can costs and sadly just two months of opening the steam circus closed after the engine derailed. Richard was left broken and spent. He would never design any more locomotives. He was consulted by Robert Vasey who tasked with the first Thames Tunnel. The directors of the new venture offered to pay Richard a healthy sum of £1,000 or £80,000 in today's money to complete the 370 metres of tunnel. Richard tried his best, but after two accidents causing a sudden inrush of water, he was forced to stall the project, and the project was never completed. Ironically, it was his techniques that helped inspire Brunel to complete his tunnel under the Thames 18 years later, and his ideas also helped build the underwater tunnel at the Michigan Railroad over 90 years later. Richard went back to his steam engines, but focused on static engines. He ended a partnership with a gentleman called Robert Dickinson. Dickinson, who was a West India merchant by trade, was very interested in the use of steam engines for his shipping company and backed several patents. The first, was a f the first design was a flop. It was a steam tug with a floating crane, but the design was scrapped after failing to meet dockside fire regulations. Richard was also the first to design iron tanks to carry water and cargo. The tanks were so well sealed, they could even be helped to raise submerged ships. This led to a new business plan as salvages. Interestingly, in 1810, Richard was documented as raising a ship near Margate, only to let it sink again when the owners refused to foot the bill. Richard enjoyed his new partnership and allowed him to patent several new inventions for the sailing world. Everything from the galley to the stern was improved thanks to Richard's influence. Sadly, it was not to last. By 1811, Richard was recovering from a bout of typhoid fever and the company was declared bankrupt. Once again, Richard had to use his own funds to pay his end of the partnership. Richard went back to Cornwall and back to his old roots and designed the Cornish boiler, one of the most efficient boilers at the time. The boiler was spectacular, pumping water and freshing wheat, saved hours upon hours of backbreaking work, which was celebrated around the county. He was happily settled when his cousin introduced him to Francisco Uville. Francisco had a huge problem. He needed a high-pressure steam engine to help him drain the silver mines in Peru. He had purchased one of Richard's boilers and was impressed with their work, and wanted Richard to come to Peru to help him. Richard agreed, hoping this new venture would be a turning point. And once again, it was not to be. Uville and Richard's partnership broke down, and Richard faced Peru alone. At first he was happy to consult mining techniques and various silver mines and the government, recognising his status, granted him mining lands and rights, but Richard only had the funds to develop just one. And just as the ore was ready to ship, he was forced to abandon it when the country was plunged into war. Richard arrived in Costa Rica in 1822 in the hope to developing the mining machinery and a practical method to get the mine, mined ore out of the country. After exploring the area on foot and dying nearly twice en route, he met by chance with Robert Stevenson's. Robert was on his way home after his own mining adventure. The two men's meeting could only be described as cold, but despite having nothing in common, Robert gave Richard £50 to help him get home. 
Defeated and owning nothing but the clothes on his back, Richard booked the next ship back to his precious Cornwall and he never went abroad again. Over the next three years, Richard worked on and off on different inventions. In the end, he was invited to help develop a new vessel in Dartford at the Halls Engineering Works. He paid for lodgings in a local hotel, but just one year after his new appointment, Richard contracted pneumonia. After fighting the illness valiantly, Richard died in his hotel bed, broke, penniless and alone. His body was carried by fellow workers and was given a pauper's burial nearby, but they acknowledged his contribution by donating to his funeral expenses and arranging a night watchman to guard over the grave to protect it. Unlike many great of engineers, it's not known where Richard's remains are buried. The cemetery was closed in 1857 and because Richard's grave was unmarked, we don't know where he is. What we do have, however, is his legacy. The original engines he worked on no longer exist, but we do have his drawings and replicas. His statue stands proud outside the library in Camborne Town in Cornwall, while the street where his engine Penny Darren made its famous run carries a plaque and a memorial in his honour. To further thank the father of steam, steam engines all over the UK come together in Camborne on the last Saturday in April and they parade in front of Richard's statue. Richard Trevevic may have had a failure after failure, but, it wasn't, but if it wasn't for his high pressure boilers and his incredible designs, and of course, his wonderful locomotives, we wouldn't have the locomotives we have today. He truly is the father of steam, and it's fitting that his bust sits within the National Railway Museum Library. Richard is a real inspiration to any inventors, and sends the message loud and clear that you don't have to have money or be famous to be a legend, just simply a very good idea. <laughs>